Welcome to episode 212 with mm-hmm. Naomi from Runaway June, Naomi Cook. Which, which by the way, you haven't done much by yourself, huh? That was the big, that, that was what I heard, that you three were like, I don't know if we can do it by my, her by herself. <laughs> no, I think that's a little misconception. We, um, we don't do, I mean, we're just doing music stuff right now, so we don't, you know, if you'd ask me to come over here and play songs, I'd be like, well, you know, the girls can come, but... Yeah, we do stuff. You I think played, it's important to have individuality. You could have played the Christmas party tonight. Oh, darn it. Yeah, we have Travis Denning playing. Should tonight. ask me. <laughs> He's going to come play. He's in the much room. better. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I was, I, I guess, reading some stuff about you that I didn't know. Because, like, we know each other a little bit. Not a yeah, lot. Not a, a lot. Bit. Not a lot, bit, but a little bit. Yeah. And you had mentioned before we went on here that you mentioned meditation. Mm-hmm. And I was reading that you meditate at the top of mountains. Is that true? <laughs> I have before. Is that an everyday thing? Do you find <laughs> your nearest mountain? Try to find a mountain every day. Yeah. Um, no, I really I really get a lot of uh, healing and fulfillment from nature. And so I'm outside as much as I can be. I mean, uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of odd, but when you're on the road, I mean, you kind of know this, but you don't get to get out as much as people think. You know, you're traveling a lot, but you don't really get to see as much. So um, when I'm off the road, I'd kind of go back out and travel and try to see spots that I haven't been to, and I, I really love to meditate in nature if I can. Isn't it crazy? You bring up a point that I think maybe people don't realize that as much as we travel, because I was in Vegas, I did one show in Vegas, and it was out, and they were like, how's Vegas? I was like, it could have been any city. Oh, yeah. The crowd was great, mm-hmm. and I love the venue, but you don't do anything except go, sound check, meet and greet, yeah. do the show, you're so exhausted, you go to bed, then you get up and you do it again You know, in another city. Yeah, I mean, and... It, it takes a lot, it takes real intention to get outside of that little wheel. Because if you keep, if, if you don't, you'll just get in that little wheel and you get really depressed. Like depression is a real thing out there. You're on the same people, you're in the same routine. So um, I make an effort every day to like try to break that routine. I get off the bus kind of before anyone wakes up and I just kind of do my Oh, are you early thing. morning, Naomi? I'm an early riser. Mm. Yeah, I am. <laughs> And I wake up at 3.30 or 4 every weekday, but I do it because I have to. Yeah. Never because I want to. I want to sleep until noon every day if I could. But you're not like that. No, I really just enjoy that time of the day a lot. It's like quiet. No one's blowing up my phone yet. Like, um, I really like watching the world wake up. It's like kind of, a, it's a meditation in itself. It's kind of spiritual, I think. So walk me through this. You come home. You have a few days off. You try to find a spot. Is that it? I'm going to go and find some... I have a spot in my some, house. Some where woodland, I go. no, some woodland area. <laughs> yeah, um, squirrel's nest. I have, yeah, no, I've I've uh, meditated in my yard a couple times. I think like meditation. Um, some of the masters of meditation tell you to get in touch with nature, like get barefoot or or take a walk or something. It doesn't have to be elaborate. Um, so yeah, I've meditated in my yard. There's a little spot in my house that I find really there's like a good energy there or something. Um, and so I, I kind of do it there. I haven't meditated outside since I've been home. So I have some friends that do transcendental meditation. And I have some friends that meditate with the app. And they believe in mm-hmm. it so much. They're all mm-hmm. slightly different. Yeah. But they believe in it so much. I have never meditated in my life. Never I meditated. I tried. Oh, I had some severe PTSD <laughs> for a long time where I got jumped and I got held at gunpoint. I had some real issues with that. My house broken into. And so the doctor was like, hey, you should really try to meditate. Because I tried everything. Because you had, Okay. Yeah, because you I were just stressed out about it. Yeah, I mean, it, it was literal PTSD where I'd, I'd been on. Dr- I'd tried all this medication, nothing was working, and the doctor was like, "You just have to meditate, like try to meditate." I would sit on the bottom of my bed, and I would try as hard as I could. And you know what would happen? I would close my eyes and go, "I no wonder which episode of The Office is on right now," or I just couldn't <laughs> separate myself from. You know what? I'm not gonna try to psychoanalyze you, but go ahead, hit me. You, you... But you're such an achiever, I think that you're trying to achieve something through meditation, and that's, like, not really what it's about when you start. I want to win meditation. How do I, <laughs> how do I win at meditation? <laughs> like, nothing's happening. Why am I not levitating? Like, come on, Bobby. It's just to quiet yourself. I mean, I don't, I don't have PTSD from being robbed. Um, I can't imagine. But what I'm is- sure PT- I mean, meditation help, helps a lot of people with that stuff. For sure. But what is the purpose? And I ask this as serious and sincere as possible because I just couldn't do it. What is the purpose of meditation? Like to you and in general? To me, I guess I can only speak for myself. Um, To me, I'm so overstimulated most of the day. Um, 
that it's just a moment for me to quietly uh, quiet my mind, quiet all the voices that are at me all the time, my own included. That's the loudest most of the time. Um, just gives you a quiet space and you can back up and watch all of that stuff happening and not be involved. And it, man, it just really gives you a perspective view of like, it's really helps me make clearer decisions. And you don't go, and how long, wait, how long do you meditate? Um, 11 minutes. Cause I'm really, longer. I have a lot of questions now. <laughs> okay. But okay, okay. 11 minutes. It's okay. I could probably do 11 ten, minutes. 10 to I'll 15. I thought you do like an hour. I mean, some people do. I haven't achieved that yet. I, I really, I can, I'm like, okay, I'm good at about 20. Sometimes it feels like an hour, though. Hmm. The only time I've ever been able to really separate myself was because I don't, I don't drink, and I've never, like, done an illegal drug. I wish I would have done all of them. Like, I just know I would do them all at once, right? I just know I would be the winner of doing drugs and drinking. I asked you that before no. one time. We were backstage somewhere, and I said, oh, you don't drink? And you were like, no, I don't. I said, you're just not interested? And you were like, no, I'm very, I'm very interested. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, t I'm too interested. Yeah, it's not a moral thing. It's like I just know I would be the champion drinker or champion. <laughs> but um, the only time that I've ever felt like you're talking about, I would go to the dentist and I would get so high on laughing gas. Oh my God. No, I, I'm not kidding. Don't, I'm not being facetious one bit. And I would be able to separate, I could separate all my worldly problems. And I actually was like thinking about the meaning of life. It was the yeah. greatest moment of my life. It's pretty amazing those chemical releases are within yourself. Like I'm not going to try to get all spiritual and weird, but it's like you can really unlock that stuff in your own brain. It's it's. Um, do you it, feel like I do on laughing gas without laughing gas? <laughs> I don't know how you felt. Oh, on laughing it was gas. the greatest. I just thought definitely was... feel better. <sighs> definitely feel better. It does feel like a drug sometimes when you're when you're that stim overstimulated. And then you're. I mean, in eleven minutes, you're able to really calm yourself down. You feel like a completely different person. Do you yeah. sleep well? Um, at times I do. I'm not a great sleeper. Um. I sleep better when I meditate. I've been ice bathing too, which has been insane. All right, here we go down this Have trail. Have you done that? No, God, no. Why, Why would I want to be cold? <laughs> I don't like cold anywhere. I don't here like cold outside. I don't like cold inside. <laughs> I don't like, and if it is cold, and I will keep my air down, but I keep a blanket over me. Why in the world would you get in an ice bath? Oh man, the benefits are wild. It's another thing. It's an antidepressant. Um, it like the the thermal regulation for your body is where you get like all this incredible um uh you get your nutrient blood so i mean it's got anti-arthritic uh anti-carcinogenic it really helps your skin where are you it's getting like this incredible. ice you going to the gas station or just getting oh, them out of the yeah lately yeah and then just dumping <laughs> in your bathtub so it's not like i'm a... gonna buy an ice machine though i mean it's getting very expensive so you take ice baths yeah for how long um three to six minutes uh, you're getting the real benefits at about two minutes. And that doesn't feel miserable to you? Oh, yeah. It's oh, it miserable. Does. But when you get out, you just get like this rush that you're like, it's a mental Finding rush too. Because you got No, to you get a <laughs> rush because you're getting back to normal. <laughs> yeah. It's like, this feels so great being a normal human. It's incredible. You're going to do it. I can tell. No, 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 no. Yeah. I would a bit. <laughs> I played football in high school. We would have to get in an ice bath. And I would be like, this sucks. And I, I mean, would get. Every major athlete does these, I think. Ice baths. That's why I quit. You done? Cry have you heard of cryo? Mm -hmm. I've done cryo when I was doing I haven't done cryo. Dancing with the Stars, and my feet hey. and my knees were hurting. And I don't know that it it's worked, same thing. but I don't know that it didn't. Right? So like, I okay. would go and do the cryo, and I would get in, and, and you get up to your neck, and they go, yeah, and, you, and it's cold. But then you get out, and you're like, eh, maybe it did not work. So why don't I keep on? I've heard that there's there's a difference between that and actually water submersion. Because your body's made up of mostly water, there's like a difference there. When you have kids, because you don't have kids, right? No. When you have kids, are you going to do natural birth, like in a creek or something? Is that, <laughs> I mean, really, is that kind of the thing? Like, you know, meditate. Well, you know, it's funny. Five of us were born, five, six were born underwater. My mom had all of us at home. All of us were born at and home. And I'm asking six that really. Like, I know yeah, you I think will, I'm actually. smiling. Yeah, I'm no. going to do an at-home water birth, yeah. I, I'm, at, I know, I'm really asking. <laughs> and I'm answering. I, okay, yeah. So yeah. is that a thing? 100%. So yeah. why would you do it underwater? Like, what's that benefit? Well, the pain level is cut in half. Um, and the baby, it's really a lot healthier for the baby. They're, it, like, really pulls back on all kinds of things that can happen during childbirth. Tearing. Oh, you want to get into this? Oh, we can get into whatever you want. <laughs> nothing, nothing scares me. <laughs> um, so I got to watch five of my siblings be born underwater. And... Um, and, you know, this, there's all this crazy, like, you see on movies, you know, 
childbirth and it's pretty horrific in, in movies. But I never experienced that with my mom. She was like, you know, in a state of, she was really excited to have the baby. It was very calm. My dad was there. All of us kids were watching. Um, and, you know, the baby's in water. So being born into water, it's breathing through. Interesting. Through I didn't think about cord. that. So like being born into water is not shocking to the baby at all. I felt like the baby would feel like it was drowning, but I guess you're right. No. If it's in water already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. That's how it should be born. So were you born in water? I wasn't born in water. No. Right after me, uh, my sister right below me on down were born underwater. How many siblings? I have 10. That's crazy. And I knew <laughs> yeah. that I knew that answer too. I just wanted you to say it. Yeah. That's crazy. So yeah. where where do you fall in the list of, of kids? I'm number five. I'm like I would be in the middle, but technically Pearl's in the middle, the one right below me. Oldest is how much older than you? So my oldest brother passed away a few years ago, but he he would be thirty nine. Okay. And your youngest this year. And the youngest one is eighteen. Just turned eighteen. Wow. Yeah. Thirty eight. Because we're all even. Half of the year, we're all even numbers. Half of the year, we're all odd. So Christian would have been 38 this year. And so, and I know a bit of your backstory. A lot of our audience may not yet. But, mm -hmm. you know, an interesting picture that you posted was a picture of the bus. Yeah. That you put on your Instagram. Yeah. I guess maybe two months ago or so. Uh -huh. um, and it was a picture of the bus. And you lived in that bus. Yeah. For how long? We lived in it for like four and a half years. A little less than four and a half. Um, so nine, no, I was, I would just, I turned nine in the bus. So eight to 12. So, and why do you get in the bus and where does the bus go? <laughs> this, how long is this podcast? As long as we, have, as long <laughs> as we want. Um, okay. So we got in the bus. This, this goes back. My mom was a midwife when I was growing up, um, and she delivered, we lived among the Amish communities for a long time because she delivered babies for the Amish. Were you Amish? <clears throat> we weren't Amish, but we lived, we, we went to church. We were involved in the community so much because of my mom that, um, you know, to live among them, you have to kind of look like them. And So some of the Amish sensibilities like were, yeah. okay. So. We lived very plainly. Um, but we weren't Amish. We still had a car. Um, my dad worked for the, for the uh, state park. We, we were kind of, just outside of it, but they didn't really care because my mom was so valuable to these communities. Um, and she was really young. She was like, you know, it was very taboo still, the, the midwifery thing at this time. Um, and this is before social media and any of that. So she got her, her uh, mentor had a woman die in childbirth with her. And she got charged with manslaughter, which women die in the hospital all the time with childbirth. Um, and so my mom got a, got scared that it was going to come down on her too. And um, her and my dad just kind of packed up, sold everything, <laughs> packed up, and they went on the road. And my mom taught seminars on like um, natural births and child rearing and living off the land and and by on the medicine. road, you mean they bought a bus and everybody hopped in. Yeah. And where were you living when that happened? We were living in Virginia at the time. And so yeah. she's like, "All right, we're going." And how does yeah. she tell you, eight, nine years old? All right, time to get the bus. We're gonna. We're heading out. Yeah, we're gonna travel, and all of us were stoked. You know, we we um we were very adventurous kids. My you know my parents let us be adventurous, and we were really excited. It was only supposed to go for about a year or two, and then um, and then it just it, it kept going. It kind of went. Uh, it didn't. It started off really good. It ended kind of bad. You know what I mean? And what what are you um, doing for school though? Like how? We did homeschooling, and then, like, the last two years, we didn't do school very much, honestly. What do you do all day as a kid traveling around with the family on a bus? So we lived in national parks, and um, we explored, and we played outside. Um, we did schooling, like, a few hours in the day, and then we, like, just, we were just out. We just played in the woods. <laughs> I mean, it's true. So you're sleeping in beds that are, I'm assuming, just kind of built all beside each other? Yeah, my dad designed the inside. So it was, we had a little kitchen and a little bathroom and then, you know, bunk beds and uh, a, little, a little front living area where two futons came down. There's plenty of beds. But it's crazy, even for me, in, in the bus that I'm in now, and how sophisticated that is. Like the and tour bus, different. not a house bus. Right. Right, you're not living in a bus <laughs> right. again. Let's yeah. Right, right, right. 
Um, it, it's it's crazy to think that 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 we did that for four years in such primitive state. You know, it's crazy. And the bathroom situation on the bus. <laughs> we had a bathroom, yeah, and we had a little septic tank. But I mean, we we weren't in it a lot, really, unless we were moving. So we would we would go outside or like in in the uh, the state park stuff. Could you build fires and mm-hmm. like you learned all that? We were encouraged to build fires. All the survival <laughs> tips. We slept outside. Oh, you did most every, of the time. Almost every night, yeah. And being in a national park, did the uh, like the park ranger they like, come up and you like have a relationship with the park ranger and be like, "What up, park ranger yeah, John?" Yeah, I mean, so interesting. Some of them, some of them. There were a couple of times, and so I'm really young here. Granted, like I'm eight, so. I'm, uh, I remember certain bits and pieces of this. Like some of them we were in for a month. Some of them we were there for two weeks. So like if you have a long stay in a, in a state park, you kind of like go to the corners, right? Um, there's not like a lot of human interaction there. Uh, we did meet a, a couple other families that were living in buses too, believe it or not. And so we would kind of like hang out with them for a little bit. So, uh, by the way, you have music. I'm going to play a little bit of music, and I'm going to come back to this. Uh, let's do buy, buy My Own Drinks. This song. I can buy my own drinks. Top five song for you guys. Yeah, congratulations on that. Let's see here. This We Were Rich song is really good. I have, the, I have all of them. I'm just going to pick a few of them right now. I like We Were Rich a lot. Here's this one. And then here is the current single, uh, Head Over Heels. What's your favorite song to sing right now in a show that you do that's in the set list? There's a song called Trouble With This Town that's been kind of a little bit of a, a little sleeper. People love it. It's, I, it's a part in the show where I'm really kind of like jacked, you know, ready to like perform that one, and it's just really fun. I feel like a rock star. Last night you did a guitar pool, is yeah. that right, with a bunch of folks? Oh, my God. We did a guitar pool with Luke Bryan, Luke Combs, um, Riley, Riley Green. Green, and Rodney Atkins. It was crazy. It was it was nuts. People flip out over these guys. It was crazy. It was a lot of fun. Um, it was a lot of fun. If, as blast. the lead vocalist, you get a cold, do they can they hop in a bit and take some of that? Could they? If you blew your voice out, could one of them sing your parts for a show if they had to? Or would you just no. go, we got to cancel the show? We've canceled before. It's been really rare. We've been blessed. Um, I, it's so funny. Every time we go to Vegas, I get sick. Literally every time. Um, I just push through it. Or, uh, you know, we'll crank the harmonies up or something. But, yeah, they they don't sing my parts. That's what we do. We crank the harmonies up. <laughs> crank the, just crank, crank them, them up, you know. Crank the harmonies there are up. Little, there are little places where, um, you know, I'll, I'll either just change the notes around, too, if I have to. Uh, you guys did Girl Crush at the CMAs last week. It was really cool. Yeah, thank yeah, you. part of that. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, whenever you are on tour with Carrie, which you guys just wrapped up, does she get you guys a cool end of tour gift or what? Yeah, she gave us this great gift. She, um, she had like, uh, she gave us plaques that were kind of like the size of this, and they have pictures of us with her from like the first time we ever met her, all the way to the end of the tour, and it was really beautiful. I prefer gifts like that. It's something I'll have my entire life. Uh, it, there was a lot of thought that went into it. I loved it. I thought it was really great. Let's go back to the bus in the early life. <laughs> okay. Very intrigued. When does music start? So my my uh, my mom started, my parents started making tie dye. <laughs> this is great. It sounds crazy even coming out of my mouth. Um, the the seminars stopped. The, the inflow of that stopped. This is before the internet and stuff, you know. So once my mom kind of moved out of that area where she was famous, it kind of started going away. Um, and so they were getting creative. My dad was kind of working on the road. He was doing, like, handyman stuff. And um, and my mom, like, fell in love with tie-dye. So she started ordering tie-dyes. And um, we found festivals. And so my mom and my parents would be selling tie-dye, and I would sit out in the festival with my guitar, and I have a little bucket, and I would – play songs like on the street corner for tips like early I was eight and a half we had one guitar and um that's where it started I mean I'd how did you learn to play guitar where was where was that the, the first here's a few chords <clears throat> where does that come from 
there was a girl who was my age uh, in this kind of like hippie commune that we happened upon who taught me like three or four chords on the guitar. And it just, I, I just started playing. It's kind of funny. People ask me how I learned. I just kind of taught myself. But I don't ever remember guitar being hard. I just like, I got the chords. and I was like, oh, it just really clicked easy. It clicked really quick. Piano was a little harder, but the guitar just felt so natural even when I was little. It was like wrapped around it. You know, it was huge. At what stage, though, of you being a kid and playing music, do you realize, one, I love this, but two, I'm actually pretty good, and not in kind of an arrogant way, but, oh, I could probably pursue this and this could be a life for me? Yeah, I'm, I, was, I was about nine. When I was making tips, I was like, oh, my God, like, you can do this and make money, you know? So I loved it. Um, and there were, there were times where, you know, we were completely broke and couldn't put gas in the bus, and I would go out and play my guitar, and we'd get, you know... 30, 40 bucks, and we'd be able to move on. Um, and that gave me a lot of confidence as a kid. I was like, wow, I can, you know, I can help my family. Looking back, I'm like, it's a little gnarly. But um, at the time, I was like, I knew then I'd do this forever. I've done lots of jobs in between, but I've always done music. What do you, what's in the, what's in the jar over here? Is that charcoal is, vinegar <laughs> that you taste milked it. from it, an this eagle? Is a, this is an herbal infusion. Taste it. You know, when Come someone on. goes, taste it, <laughs> you're not going to tell me anything about what it is? It's an herbal infusion. It's got tons of chlorophyll in it's it. It's not alcohol, right? No, no. Do you know how pissed I would be, Mike, if, if <laughs> is Naomi's the one, my first, first This is, this is how it She's like, taste it. <laughs> okay, so wait. what? It's a little bit bitter, but also kind of sweet. Is it water-based? Yes. It's like a, it's, I guess you describe it as a oh. tea. Come on. It looks like molasses. So dark. Oh, this it's, is it's a good batch. No, yeah, okay, yeah. good. Yeah, Thanks. it's actually no. You know what? It's actually pretty good. So wait, what is this, and why are you drinking it? So this is um, this is nettle leaf and oat straw and comfrey, and it's just a herbal infusion mix that I drink when I when I'm feeling like my body's depleted and worn out. Um, I mean, my mom's been making these for her clients when she, when I was little. I I was drinking this in a sippy cup, you know. I'm talking like soup, like bef this is way before this, you know, Whole Foods was barely a thing then. Um, but yeah, I've been drinking that stuff for a long time. She still drinks them. Your mom does? Yeah. Oh, she, yeah. You still close with your mom? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does she have a cell phone? Yeah, she does. Oh. Hey, listen, don't, no, don't look at me and <laughs> Unfortunately, laugh. Unfortunately, my asking, mom has a cell phone. No, no. I'm asking these <laughs> questions with genuine curiosity because I don't know. She, she has a cell phone and she has Instagram and Facebook and it's like, oh, mom. What does Help she me. think about what you're doing and where you've gone? It's a good question. I, you know, it's funny. People ask me about, ask my family, my, my siblings that. And they're not really surprised. And I don't mean to sound any any way by saying that. But it's not like I, I didn't win American Idol or something like after working at Target. I've been doing this literally since I was little. Um, so I think I'm surprised that I, that. I've gotten here a lot of times, but also it's like, you know, I've worked really hard. It's like people ask me, you know, do you pinch yourself? And I'm like, no. I feel the same way. <laughs> I know exactly what it took to get this. I do, I feel and I don't wake up and go, how did I get here? Like, I freaking know. And it was a lot of hard work and sacrifice, and it still is. And I, I know. I love it that you say that because, I, you know, people will be like, can you believe? That you're on TV. I'm like, you're I've, been so freaking, I've been freaking grinding it out, <laughs> yes. flying back and forth, I'm killing myself. Yeah. I yeah, I, yeah. I do believe it. It's almost like there's some way that we're supposed to be ashamed to say that, and I think it's because um, maybe other people don't want to see that that grit part that we've had to do. It's not as glamorous, but you know they they want to think it's kind of like a lottery, but it's just not. It's just not true. Like, you know, this takes a lifetime of dedication and and giving up giving up a lot and also gaining a lot but yeah i don't i don't pinch myself so you're in the family bus until what age until i was let's see 10 11 11 okay then where do you go so we came back to tennessee actually after we got out of the bus we were stranded in arizona for like six months and that was really tough. What do, parents, what do, what, why stranded? Run out of money? Are you yeah, trapped somewhere? Yeah, my dad had some really like heavy depression issues, and um, he he started to kind of like crack in the bus, like towards the end. Um, he's like four. He like turned forty in the bus, 
I think that that kind of pressure it just really got to him and he uh he started to kind of lose his mind a little bit honestly um and he would sleep all day and and couldn't work um and depression is debilitating it's a real thing people die from that too um so we were stranded there my mom was like doing everything she could to work I'm playing the guitar my brother was roofing with um a crew of Hispanic guys, my sister, you know, we were just kind of like trying to survive that. We ended up getting enough money to be able to make it across the state where we had some friends in Tennessee. And we landed in this little like dilapidated farmhouse, but we'd always lived in like broken down homes. Like I, I don't ever remember having more than one bathroom in our house. Um, but it just felt good to like be grounded again. And like, you know, we had a mailbox and it was like that, that whole thing. It felt like we, my parents' marriage might work out. They really started to fall apart towards the end of the bus. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we landed in Tennessee and, and lived here for a few years. And my brother, my brother was in prison while we were in the bus, and he came back to that house and lived with us for a little while. So it, there's a lot of good memories there, even though, uh, even though to look at it or to be there even then, it was, like, you know, pretty gnarly, I think. But... I have a lot of fond memories from that house. As a kid, if you're 13 or 14, you know, the pressure is, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to mm. be when you grow up? Where do you, what was at 13 or 14 when someone would say, hey, what do you want to be, Naomi? Like, what was your answer to that? I wanted to be a country singer. <laughs> so, and it felt, it's, it's funny you, you mentioned those ages because that's the age where I started to doubt this could ever happen. Because I just didn't know. I thought that, you know, you had to have voice lessons or you had to have rich parents or connected some way. I just wasn't at all. Um, I, I did get some music lessons from some friends of our family who, who recognized that I had talent and a hunger and they wanted me to, to pursue that. And so they paid for me to have lessons for like two months. And that really just gave me more confidence. Um, but I did. I wanted to be a singer. I didn't know, even know what that meant, but I, I wanted to be an artist and a singer or an oceanographer. <laughs> the, the always one weird thing you yeah. have to want to be as a kid. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. Yeah, your, your story <laughs> and my story definitely have some parallels in, mm -hmm. in the thinking process because I grew up, you know, a poor kid in Arkansas. Nobody around me did anything near what I wanted to do. I've I did. heard remnants of your story. Well, I just never know. Mostly no. from other people. And they're uh, and they're probably wrong. I made the whole thing <laughs> probably. up. Yeah, yeah. I grew up a trust fund kid in Pennsylvania, <laughs> but I, I lived, you know, in a town of seven hundred people in Arkansas, and, and you know, and it was a food stamp kid. But nobody me around me was ever doing what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I always wanted mm -hmm. to be a comedian and a radio host, and and I always want I wanted to do all these things, but there was nobody to tell me that I could do it. Nobody was there to say I couldn't. Right. But there was, and I didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, as you're exactly. like, you want to be a country singer. And how I do didn't you know one singer? How do you become a country? I, I had no <laughs> yeah. connections either. I went and begged to clean a radio station. Wow. You know, and, and so th that's what I did. And, that, and, you know, that's what's interesting about your story is like, how in the world, when you have no connection to the outside, do you get outside to become a country singer? So I started gigging. I was about 15. And what does gigging mean where you are? Where are you in Tennessee at this point? So we moved to Florida. Okay, um, so you're in Florida. Right. So my parents, my brother passed away in a car accident, um, and my parents' marriage just didn't survive that. Um, and so my mom packed all of us up, and we moved to Florida, and she raised nine kids down there. <laughs> and we had a greenhouse that we all ran, um, and we were close to this little island called Cedar Key. Probably like, I say close, but about like 20 miles. Um and I got a job playing my guitar. I, there was some other, there was another kid there that played his guitar um, at some of the restaurants. And I was like, okay, I think I could do that. And I had a guitar. I had no equipment. Um, and I had some friends there that were like kind of like meddling musicians, I call, um, that let me borrow some equipment. And I just started playing at some of the local restaurants. And that's where I, I started gigging. Would you see big eyeballs when you would sing? Meaning you start singing, they go. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. I did. I, I think uh, I, I, I got that for a long time. People didn't expect that, I guess, for me to have as much. I really sang with a lot of passion, I think, for my age. So you're 15 or 16, you're playing shows. Do you kind of feel like, all right, I'm good enough to do this. I just somehow got to find a path. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I thought about going to school. There was a lot of that, too. You know, I just didn't know what the next step was. I didn't really believe that I could go to Nashville. That seems so, like, something anything that people on TV, don't do. Yeah, anything on TV right. doesn't feel like normal. Yeah, people, like, like real life. Mm-hmm. Just felt like, how do I do that? Um, maybe I'm not meant to do that. Um, so I had a little bit of a detour where uh, I got into a car accident. I was completely broke. Uh, and I got a job offer to be a deckhand on a salmon boat in Alaska. And so I went up there for... How does... By the way, are you on Craigslist? Like, how does an <laughs> offer come through? Like, a random offer to be a deckhand in a state nowhere near you. Like, I get Florida it. to Alaska. Yeah, if you yeah. get an offer at the local Chili's, I get it. It's, a, it's nearby. There's someone looking for people to come. Like, I was a waiter for a long time. And you're like, oh, you need somebody. I'll go. But it's... Are you going to be a bartender? How do you get yeah. a random offer? You're... In Alaska, who, where does that job offer come from? So I'll break it down. We, when I, uh, so we're in Florida, right? So there's a lot of people that fish. Um, my, my stepdad, my mom remarried. Sorry, it's a little jumbled. No, it's all lot. great. I'm following um, you here. Okay. So my mom got remarried, um, and he went to Alaska every year and had been doing it for about five years. So he went for the season and he called in the middle of the night and said that that their deckhand had fallen into a fish, fish hold and broke his ankle and couldn't work anymore, and they needed somebody really fast. And um, What does a deckhand do, by the way? <laughs> I mean, I've been on fishing boats. Everything. Boat. Okay, so oh my gosh. a deckhand just You clean the nets, you, you're fishing, you're driving the boat, you're cooking, you literally do everything. And they wanted you, no offense, you're like five foot three. <laughs> How tall are you? Five three. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're like five three, t- and they want you... Well, they didn't want me. I just, I was the first one that volunteered. Okay. And and uh, and I think Rick knew that I had some grit and I was tough enough to, like, withstand that. I, I didn't know that I was. I had no idea what I was getting into. This was, like, the gnarliest, hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, but I flew up there. I, I'm glad that I didn't know what it was because I, I wouldn't have gone. You know, I don't think I would have. Um so I did that for a summer, and then when I came back, I felt really clear about like, okay, if I can do that, I can move to Nashville. Like I can, I can move to Nashville. I can play music. Like, what if it doesn't work? I'll never be as poor as I was before this. And like, like, what happens if I if I do? Like, who knows? Isn't it crazy too? There's such freedom, and I looking back now, being so poor as a kid. I, there, I was always like, you know what? The worst thing that can happen is where I am now, and you know, it ain't so bad, and I'm actually <laughs> yeah. pretty good at being poor. I was always exactly. like, I was like, what is what is yeah. there to lose? Oh yeah. Because again, if all this goes away, I was I, fi- I had figured out how to survive on very little, mm-hmm. and so there was, a, it was it's a quite, very dangerous person. Yeah. Someone there's, who there's nothing to lose. I can go back to nothing. Yeah. I was happy there. Actually, like mess with Maybe me. Maybe happier. <laughs> I, and I and I felt that way a lot. It was what's the worst thing that can happen? I go back to where I've already been, mm-hmm. and yeah. was, and that was my normal. Yeah. So you're you're in that spot again. I hear you say that, and that, that resonates with me because I felt a bit of the same way through my life. And you're you're there. And when do you finally go? All right, Nashville, we go. And then what car do you go in? Oh my God. Okay, so let's see what car did I have. I bought a blazer. A blazer that had no AC. So I only I only made like five grand in Alaska, um, which seemed like so much at the time. Um, I bought a blazer for like twelve hundred bucks, and I my sister lived in Nashville with her boyfriend at the time, and I went and lived in her basement. I drove it up on uh, I don't know. I think I did this on like two hundred and fifty bucks, literally, like nothing. Um, and I just I got straight to Nashville, and I just walked down. Um, Broadway, and I just h- handed out these little demos that I had made in Florida, and I got a job at Tootsie's like two days later. And so you go and you're just singing at Tootsie's. How many? Mm-hmm. Like like a four hour spot? Yeah, doing the four hour thing. Yeah, yeah, I did that. But you know that one, that one had its own challenges. Uh, but I did learn how to like work with a band and work bigger crowds, and like you know I learned a lot down there. And then I started working at the airport, which was like a totally different thing, but a lot more money, a lot. A lot more chill. Okay, I'm interested in both of these. So let's start with a Tootsie's. <laughs> You're working at Tootsie's. Do you see people come into Tootsie's that you go, man, if they, like, and you, you would know who they were, and you go, man, if they just would like what I'm doing, they could actually give me a shot. Did that ever happen where you would see somebody in the crowd? 
like an artist or a publisher at Tootsie's? It's funny. I didn't. I didn't. I did see Dina Carter come in one time. She was so cool, and she came up and sang with a girl who was singing Strawberry Wine when she happened to like walk in. She was so cool. I never saw. I never saw artists like that as like a, like oh my gosh if they could just. I kind of knew that's not how it worked. Um, and I had met a songwriter in Florida who is in Nashville. Um, his name's Rob Hatch, and he's had some really good success here. Um, and his wife worked at CSAC, and they really, really mentored me. Um, while I was cleaning houses and working at Tootsie's, I was, I was writing, and like they really, they really helped me. Um, but I never saw, I, I did, I saw like Joe Nichols. It, you'd be surprised, not a lot of people go into Tootsie's, but the people that I did, I just knew that's not how it was gonna work. It wasn't gonna happen like that for me. What was your it. song? Where did, what was the song that it was like once or twice a night you would sing it and you knew that's where you get a 20 or so. Like you knew that when you sang this one, people were gonna throw some real money. Wagon wheel. Really? Yeah. Actually, I would have people request it and then tell them that it was a $50 song. And they would, they would pay for it every time. Every, they loved it. <laughs> Let me back up just one second because I do want to get to the airport. When you're on a salmon boat, do you have a boyfriend? I didn't have a boyfriend, no. Mm -mm. When you're doing and moving around the country, did you have a boyfriend? I didn't date a lot. Um, I didn't date a lot. I think I, I like wasn't a salmon, really like that wasn't like my focus. You salmon know? catchers. <laughs> yeah. Like farmers that, believe only. Believe me, there were plenty. <laughs> That's funny. There, like there were like... Here's the thing, when you're in Alaska on that boat, there's not like, if you're having interaction, it's like, you don't sleep there. It's, you're going 22 hours, you're going absolutely to the legal limit of not sleeping. Um, and then a lot of the other people fishing up there are Russian, and there's some other Alaskans, but you just really, you're not interacting, like you're just fishing. And I never, I never even got onto land. I was literally out for five weeks on the water. Were you ripped, muscular, like in, yeah. in great shape? I was in good shape. Yeah. What would you eat? Just fish? Fish, straight out of the net. We had some stuff, you know, stock. I, I had, you know, we ate rice, uh, not a lot of grains, mostly fish, mostly raw fish. I mean, it was the the best fish, the most nutrients you can get. That's crazy. It was it was pretty crazy. Okay, so you, Tootsie's Airport. So where and how do you get the job at the airport? Does someone see you? So yeah, so a guy that I was playing with. Uh, at Tootsie's on uh, music on a, on Broadway, he kind of told me when we were counting on our tips one night that he was going to start playing at the airport. I'd never even you heard of Tootsie's this. at the airport. Yeah. Okay. The Tootsie's so there's a, there's a small Tootsie's at the yeah. airport, and you walk by, and it's always somebody singing a bad version of <laughs> yeah. "Walk the Line." As you're trying to get to Gate 27, and it's some guy singing "Walk the Line" every time. So it's so true. It's yeah. there. So you're, and he says he work, he's going to work there. Yeah. So he said he was going to start there, and. Uh, I was like, why? You know, because I'd been to the airport. And uh, he was like, said, I heard the money's way better and like I can make my own hours, whatever. I was like, okay, well, let me know how it goes. Well, about a month later, he came back and I was like, how's it going out there? He was still doing gigs on Broadway. There's like a little club of musicians that do it. Um, and he said, it's going great. I'm making bank. I like love it. I'm not having to perform as hard. And I was like, uh, okay. So I really started to think about that. I was dying to get off of, of Broadway. It was like just sucking my soul dry. I didn't feel like I was going anywhere. Um, I wasn't meeting anyone. And uh, so I, I requested if I could just try it. And it started working. And I, I like it was so different and so much better. I was the money it. better? So much better. Why? That's weird. Because Why? I, because the people that are coming to the airport, a lot of them don't get out don't get to get out to Nashville. So it's like the first little piece of Nashville they see and they're enamored. Um, and they buy your merch and they like love that piece of Nashville. It's like so unique. And, uh, or they think they might be, you know, tipping a future superstar. Um, so I, I don't know. I just really had a, I had a much better experience there. And I, I only did that about six months. So you're there six months, you're paying the bills, mm -hmm. you're working, at, you're having to go through security every mm -hmm. day. Do you have a different badge? They give you yeah. a badge. Like they a... gave me a little badge, but I mostly had an escort. Yeah. So if somebody to walk you through. That's mm -hmm. so cool. <laughs> you get walked through the, at the airport, and then when does it go? Okay, I think this is over. Like, what was it? What was that step? I started cleaning houses, um, and I just wanted to. I just wanted to get out of the Tootsie circuit. It was just killing me. I wasn't able to write. 
Um, so I started cleaning houses more, and that allowed me even more time on my own. Um, and then I got a Tyler Farr cut with before I had a publishing deal, and it became a single, so I got a little bit of a break what there. What song? Better in Boots. Okay, yeah. 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 Um, it didn't get super high on the chart, but it was a big break for me at the time. Um, so you have no publishing deal? I had no publishing deal. And you get deal. a single mm -hmm. with a major artist? Mm -hmm. Wow. How did that, how'd you get that right? What was that whole situation? So the, the songwriter I was telling you about, him and his wife were setting me up on co-writes and, and trying to get me a publishing deal. Um, and that's how that happened. I just was in a, a writing room with Justin Moore, uh, uh, Justin Moore, um, Justin Wilson and Dave Pittenger. And so not only does he go, hey, we're going to put this on hold, we're going to cut it, and then it's a freaking single? Yeah. <laughs> so the publishing company start going, oh, she has no publishing deal. We should we should get on this. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Wow, good for you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. That was a, that was a huge stroke of luck. But I, I do, and I think you believe this too, like luck is preparation meets opportunity only. Um, and I was busting my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Still am, but like I, it, it felt it was like a really it was like a break. Okay, you're doing the right thing. It was kind of like a little omen, um, and then and then uh, I was I was still trying to be an artist at the time. I didn't just want to be a songwriter. I really wanted to be an artist, but I was doing the solo thing, and um, I did a showcase, and Benny Brown came to that. He used to own our label, and uh, he called me a couple weeks later. And he said, hey, I know this girl. Um, she has a hit with Eric Pasley right now. She's a great writer. I want to I, I want to see if you'll write with her. He loved my voice. He thought I was a star, but he didn't like my songs at all. And uh, I was like, sure, I'll write with her. And um, he introduced me to Jennifer Wayne. So you guys get together. Mm -hmm. At this point, though, do you have a publishing deal? Like, are you able I to? I did have a pub. Well, I waited. It really kind of happened quickly. So I got the Tyler Farr single. And then um, my record deal like came very shortly after. Like we were offered a record deal. Kind of, I was still writing. I was writing with Jen at this time. This happened like within like two months of me getting the single. Let me back up one second because I used to clean houses too. My grandma and I would clean houses. Did you? Well, yeah. And so whenever I always tip the 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 cleaners. You still hotels, do. Hotels, yeah. Good for Hotel, you, the, Bobby. But did that affect? <laughs> does that affect you when you're staying in hotels or whenever you're staying places? Like I always strip the sheets for them. Um, I leave tips whenever I have cash. Uh, and you have to leave it on the pillow because if you leave it somewhere else, sometimes they don't know if you left it for I'm them or not. Nervous that someone else is gonna find it. What's the worst case scenario though? Someone else does find it and they know, keep right? it. Like somebody. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I heard a comedian say this one time. Um, where everyone's like, I'm not going to give that homeless person money. They're just going to spend it on booze and drugs. And he's like, that's what I'm going to spend it on when at the end of the day. Like, <laughs> look at this hom homeless guy. He's going to spend it on it. Like, what do you want him to do? Buy a CD rack for his box? You know, it's funny. I, yeah, God forbid someone else finds it. Like, someone needs it. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I wonder if that's affected your – because I waited tables for a long time. Me too. Uh -huh. Which everybody should have to be a server at some mm. point. When I'm president, I think <laughs> – you know how a lot of countries oh. make you serve? I want to make everybody be a waiter so they can understand. Customer the, service. Yes, the plight of having to, to, to deal with people. Oh, the humility that comes with that. But it also is such a great tool for, for life. And then, you know, I, I feel like I tip because I wanted to be tipped mm -hmm. because I actually know what that's like. Do you tip someone that gave you bad service? Yeah, absolutely. You do? I give them even more. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I really I, well because I was a waiter and there would be times where I sucked, but it was not my fault. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I also am in the place now where I finally have a good living. Like I'm fine, mm -hmm. and so there's no reason not to tip. Yeah, there's no reason to tip somebody fifty, sixty percent because the times that people would come in that were in my situation, they would tip me. I could make an insurance payment much quicker right. because of that. Like it was life <laughs> altering. Know. Yeah. Because I was living week to week. Yeah. And when someone would come in and give me $20 as a tip, it would ch change the whole week for me. So I feel oh, yeah. now like I wish that I'm just doing what I wish someone would did. For, I'm no bleeding heart great yeah. guy. <laughs> I just wish that people had done that for me and some did. So now I'm kind of playing to myself back in time. I feel like I'm just tipping me back in time. Yeah, I, I feel that. I had, I had some people really, really help me out. I mean, I've had so many people that, that have helped me. Um, and it, it matters and little things like that. Like... Well, even the person paying for your lessons. Oh, huge. Huge. 
Mm-hmm. Like in two ways. I gave one, them credits in, in, in the album. I was, really? Yeah. I wouldn't. I don't think that I would be here without people like that. It, and it, it, two, it does two things. One, you got some lessons. But I think the bigger picture was you saw that someone cared enough to actually invest in you, which makes you want to invest in other people mm-hmm. too the same way. Mm-hmm. And so that's so cool you did that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it didn't really like... I always knew that I was like, if I get a record deal, if I get this stuff, like I'm gonna credit these people. You know, they were kind of the only family that we ever had, really. Too, my parents weren't close with their families, and they were the only type of aunt and uncle I knew. Um, it's huge, very, very big. Okay, back on. We're gonna get. We're, we're bouncing, but we're good. <laughs> we're following. I'm it. Sorry, no, no, I'm bouncing kind of, too. Okay. I'm bouncing too. Okay, so you and Jen, or Jennifer Wayne, excuse mm-hmm. me, decide. And I've known Jen for a, for a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you and she, and she also played tennis with one of our best friends. She, oh, really? Yeah, I have a friend who's a professional tennis player. Okay. And he was, but her last name wasn't Wayne. Yeah. And I was like, hey, dude, do you know Jen Wayne? He's like, yeah, but her name, she, when she played tennis, yeah. she was, I guess was going Jennifer by. Jennifer Kuehl. Yeah, yeah, her, yeah. That's her real last name. Yeah. And so you guys are riding, and you're going to become a duo? No. Um, no. We were just writing songs. Okay. Um, and... We were writing with another girl. It was another girl. You know Caroline Hobby. Mm-hmm. Caroline wrote a lot of the songs that we have. Um, and when we went in and wrote, when we went in and played those songs for the label, um, Benny Brown offered us a deal as, as a group okay. right then, which I knew he had that cooking all, all along. Here I think I'm writing for me, you know, and he's like, no, I'm going to get this group together. It had to, had to happen naturally. Um, and... I'd never even considered being in a band. I didn't. I. I don't know why. I just never crossed my mind. But I. I knew right then I was being offered an opportunity, like the one, um, and I think too. I'm like, you know, you like you're like a bratty kid. You know, you're gonna ask for a bike. Like I want a. I want a pink bike. I want a pink bike. And then, you know, God gives you a black bike. It's a bike. Like take the bike. You know. So that's how I looked at it. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this band thing. And I had a lot of people like, what? You know, you're going to do this? And you're the, you're the, you should, you're, you should just keep on doing what you're doing. Just keep on. I was like, I don't think that's the right thing. So we, we got offered a a record deal as a group with Caroline. And, um, and we got into it down the road and, and she was like, you know what? This is just not really my path. I don't think this is for me. Um, and, uh, we, it was pretty, it was happened really fast. Like Caroline kind of really knew right away. She was like, I'm not, I'm not going to be doing this. Like this is not, not my path. Um, and so Jennifer knew this girl, Hannah Mulholland, who was an incredible songwriter and she brought her in to write with us. And uh, we asked Hannah to join the group. Once we had written a few songs, she was incredible. Sing low harmony. She was great. So that's how this band formed it's that way. So if you're the hippie one, are you, are you the hippie, you're the hippie one. Hi. You're the hippie one. Okay. You're the hippie one. <laughs> you don't think you're the hippie one? Mike, don't you think she's um, the hippie one? I would say so, yeah. What would you say? I, that's I, not a bad thing. That's a good thing. No, I don't, I don't think, think it's bad. bad. You have a bandana on your arm. It makes me hippie. You have a crystal on your neck. I have you have a, a, a wolf. You have hair. a wolf on your shirt. <laughs> like, All right, fine. You're the hippie one. Okay, what are you going to be, the hipster one? I, have a, I would say I'm like a little earthy, I guess. Okay. You okay. If Whatever. You're the, if you're the, I, I'm drinking herbs yes. over here. If you're the earthy one, <laughs> what is Hannah? Which what's the Hannah's w- got like this like 70s like Would she be more hippie Bardo. than you then? Yeah. I mean, I guess like there's different kinds of hippies. Would I you only, like that I only education? Know, I only know one. <laughs> I only know the kind that do a peace sign. <laughs> <laughs> and, and go to Woodstock. Hannah definitely has some hippie vibes. She's like a vegan, and um, she's she's kind of like earthy too. She's from Malibu. She's like, so she is she earth. like surfer hippie. She's not like very coordinated. I don't think she could surf, but yeah, but beach yeah, hippie, beachy, yeah. yeah she, your earth, like all the all the dwarves, seven dwarves had all uh-huh. the other things. Yeah, <laughs> you're guys, like you're, the sister you're like earthy June. <laughs> yeah. She's beach hippie June. What is Jen Wayne? Jen is Mama June. She's like the mama hen. She worries. Um, she is a worrier. She worries. She'll text me and be like, hey, I heard, I heard this. Are you I'm okay? Wor- yeah. Is this happening? <laughs> it's so sweet. You know, she she really is like one of the most empathetic people I know. Um, and she's very sensitive to like energies and feelings and stuff. And 
Um, she's also very kind of ethereal. She's very, like, light. She's kind of like a little angel. You know, when you see her, she's, like, tall and blonde and, like, looks like this. It's funny. She tells, she tells everyone that she's Peruvian. Her, her grandmother is, like, full-blooded Peruvian. And Jen looks like a Nordic, like... Yeah, she could be from Sweden. Amazonian, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess that's how I would describe Jen. I think, yeah, I think that's accurate. And you guys are still getting along? Yeah. And do you have boundaries? Yeah. That's Because the boundaries are actually really good for relationships. Oh, yeah. More so than a pillar to divide. Totally. Yeah, I mean, we do counseling. We have before. Good for like, you. I love that. so important. It's such a great part of... Mm -hmm growing totally is to have someone that's go, keep talking because I'm yeah. such a big therapy uh, I'm person. in therapy all the time yeah. I, I do therapy as much as I can um here's the thing you're you're we're not just a band we're married you know we're legally bound to each other we share money we make all of our decisions together you know we have a, a we have employees uh that racks your relationship really can rattle you there's like little things uh, there's all these personalities we're very sensitive people we're you know emotional and sensitive and creative and we all have these ideas and we're all very different um and we're all very very alike so you know a small decision or a big one can like rattle you you have to really really know each other be extremely considerate um communicative compromising and you don't you're not born with those skills you know you have to learn them uh, and it, we treat it like it's a marriage. I know a few other people who are actually in marital counseling in their band. It's like for a marriage. I know bands too that go in. Because yeah. again, if you want to perform at a high level, you your mental capacity has got to be in that spot. And to do that, you got to be in a healthy place. Yeah. So it's a business decision. Yeah. Same thing Otherwise, with a, you're making emotional decisions, yeah. which will wreck your life. My, my therapist, she lives near here. But she does relationships only. She does couples. Mm -hmm. I go on by myself. I'm the first mm -hmm. person she's ever had going by, by themselves. And I sit in a chair. And so it's like me and you if we were in uh -huh. together. And she's over here. But there's no one in that other chair. Interesting. And there, but she's never. We're kind of like an experiment with each other. Do you talk to someone else? No. You talk to her, mm -hmm. but you sit. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Because that's just her normal room. And she doesn't ever do solos. Never. No, she just. I'm the only guy. I'm the only. You're so. like. You're like two people. That's how much. Of Maybe that's what it is. I have to pay <laughs> that's double. That's why she <laughs> took this on. <laughs> and she thought it was interesting. It's like you're like two screwed up people. I'll take you. I was like, hey, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and so she said, okay, let's try. In the first couple weeks, and I've been with her now for months, but the first couple weeks that I went in, we were like, let's see if we both want to do this. I'm just yeah. such a big believer, and I need somebody from from an outside that doesn't have an investment in my personal life. Oh, God. To lead me places. I don't need you to tell me. I don't need you to, to take me there all the time. Just sometimes repoint me in a direction. Let's see where I go. I am sure that you get this all the time. Like, people are like, have you read this book? Or are you reading this book? But there's this book. And it's called The Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. It's incredible. It, like, talks about your emotional self and how... People are not in touch with that thing. This is what my therapist is teaching me. Um, you make emotional decisions when you think you're being rational. Um, it's so crazy. People are very complicated. And I think the first mistake that you can make with someone is thinking that they're not complicated. Um, and especially yourself. Like when you're like, oh, I'm kind of like a simple guy. I've only got, you know, these certain things. Or I'm particular about these things, but not this. It's like you're so wrong. People just don't even know themselves. So... Um, Therapy has helped me a lot in that way to like get to know my emotional self because you in this job were emotionally stimulated and triggered all the time. And then you're set with like this big decision to make that involves a lot of people. And uh, if you're not careful, like you'll just really, really slip. And maybe you will. I know I have, but it's uh, it's something we have to be on our toes about because people are all around you and, and you're there's no one way to do this. And uh, so you just have to really be in touch with yourself, I think. Mine just has me challenging negative thoughts. That's my, I leave going, <laughs> I need something I can come back with. I need a, like an execution point. Mm -hmm. Every time I leave, like, what do, like, give me something to work on. Yeah. I left yesterday. Negative like, thoughts. Well, just chat because my question to her was, and she was like, oh, no one's ever asked me that. I was like, hey, can you grow out of trauma? Like, can you, you know, let's say something happened to me at 12. It was pretty awful. 
I'm 39. Like, I should be able to shake that by now. And she's right. like, you know, it's not that you grow out of it. So the answer is no, but you can have so much positive things kind of outweigh where you sort of think differently about it because so much good has happened. Or if you have trauma that happens to you mm -hmm. and it's a big part, it's a major part of your life and your decisions, it is, you know, if it's 70 part of your thinking process, it, that's, that's, a, that's a wear. She goes, but if so much good stuff's happening to you, the trauma's still there, but you're starting to see, oh, great things can happen too. Does that mean that when you start to see other things that are good, you maybe start to understand that thing that gave you trauma? A bit. Which is super powerful, right? Yes. You know, and even when you say see things, we were talking yesterday, not to go full therapy on it, who cares? But uh, Let's have a therapy session. Yeah, right. <laughs> it was, um, I, because she's a, like a love, she's not a love doctor, she's a, like a doctor. She's a, a real life doctor. doctor. No wonder you're going by but yourself. That's, that's what she works, that, like that's her thing, relationships, right? <laughs> And, she, and she's like, you know, here's why you're not good at relationships. You've never seen a successful one. Like, yeah. I never knew my dad. My dad left when I was, you know, mm -hmm. five or six years old. My mom remarried and divorced. My mom died. My when grandmother and died? grandfather. When old did she? Were you? Uh, she was 46. She, uh, yeah, she died from drugs, you, alcohol. How old were you? Older-ish, but she was always an addict. So I never knew her not being an addict. Wow. Do you have siblings? I have a sister. Okay. And then like a half brother through a dad. I don't know. I have an Arkansas gotcha. family where they're kind of sprinkled <laughs> all over in different ways. I have like an eighth cousin. <laughs> yeah. An, yeah, don't try me. Yeah, I can't yeah. follow. I have like a, sis, <laughs> a, a, a sister wife somewhere. It's a whole thing. An uh, uncle daddy. Yeah, somewhere. all of that. And But it was, you, I've never seen a really successful relationship, so that's why they seem so foreign to me. Because I'm like, I watch these shows, and I'm like, that's not true. Yeah. She's like, you just haven't seen one. Right. Like, and in, in a lot yeah. of my friends have also been like, oh, this isn't working. So they've all moved in with me at some point. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that was the big, the big thing yesterday. And does that change your, mar your, your outlook on marriage? No, but it or makes... Is that kind of why you're seeing someone is to like... Yeah. Help that perspective? Perspective, vulnerability. Yeah. When you're a survivalist your whole life, you, yeah. uh, you've only built walls around you so long that you still live with those walls even though you don't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that too. Yeah. But it's, it's crazy you guys are going to therapy as a band. That's so exciting. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I, I mean, I, it's... I know a lot of bands that do this. This isn't like something out of nowhere. Um, we've, we were advised that early on to do it. And it's like, it's even with, you know, if you're getting married, it's like premarital counseling. Like, let's make this bridge strong before there's a break in it. You know, that's kind of, it's not, it's not because something happened or like something will. You know, we should all be, we should all be as prepared as we can be. Um, and we care about it. We care about this and we care about each other enough to have the tools to not do damage while we're trying to build this thing um and then i see a therapist on my own which i love it it really really helps me stay grounded and you know we're, we're in a tumultuous little business here it's like very very strange and different every day and uh guy or girl your therapist guy girl. Or, yeah mine's a, mine's a woman too hmm. do you ever do oh i was only raised by women mom grandma i was adopted mm -hmm. my grandmother for a while mm -hmm. so i only feel comfortable with older yeah women telling me what to do yeah <laughs> That's gonna move. Um, do you ever do the where they just sit and they're quiet at you, and you know, because that's a t that's a technique, right? And I also uh -huh. do it in this. But so since I talk to people and get things out of them with that technique, when she does it to me, she'll just sit there, because silence. Like, oh, I know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, I'll just sit and stare at her too. <laughs> I'll wait her out. We'll staring game. You know, the funny thing is, is that people love to talk about themselves. So it's like not. If you just sit there and listen, like they'll tell you, eh, they'll tell you all kinds of stuff. Well, I'll ice her out. She'll look at me, <laughs> and I know the technique. And That's she, not what therapy is, I Bobby. Know. You're, like, there, yeah. there, You're also trying to, to win war. therapy. Yeah, I'm trying to <laughs> win therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to win therapy. Here, let me roll through some quick, quick answers here. <laughs> okay. uh, do you wear a GoPro when you downhill bike? Um, I have before. I just bought one, and I haven't used it yet. Insane. Yes. I will see your Instagram stories on that oh. bike, and I'm like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> But that's a thing, huh? Where you ride downhill yeah, really fast. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Have, have you ever done anything like that? Do you bike or anything? Do, do anything oh, like don't, what? Oh my god, stop! You're super athletic. Dude, but oh, that doesn't mean you I ever would, done this. It, it, you should go. I you should go with I can't me. Can't injure day. things on me. If I what? come on, I feel yeah. so alive. Like I'm if, living. Do they have bunny slopes? If you would take me to a bunny <laughs> slope, I would do a bunny slope, and then we would just. No, work. I'm sorry. You just got to get on the bike and go. It's you know, like you a, don't try to hero it. Like if you see a huge jump, just don't do it. But um, yeah, it's been really fun. I, I've been to Whistler in Canada and uh, Aspen, Jackson Hole. Um, 
There's a little bike park around here, but like you. That's what I would do. Yeah, you you can rent a bike. We go to the little bike park, (laughs) and then we can do that. I'm like ready to put you on a bike and smack your ass. Go. (laughs) Your little bike, little hills. um, Little helmet. Your your style, vintage stores or just really cool new stuff that looks old. What's what's what do we have here? Oh, um, yeah, I use a a mix of everything. Like I I just kind of like I just wear what I what I like. How about your Instagram post? Do you take a lot of the picture over and over again to find one, or are you just like, boom, there it is, that's the one? What do you mean, like Well, like sure, selfies? any picture at all, you know? Do you, do you like, take 100 and I'll pick one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, just seeing how earthy you are. <laughs> well, how do, how do seeing you, how real you are right now, how much do you filter it? No, the realness is if you answer the question <laughs> real, not in how you actually okay. do it. Uh, how mm. do you feel about Instagram removing the likes? I love it. I think it's so smart. I think that um, when I first started Instagram, it was all about the photos, um, which I love that. That's kind of why I got – I don't have a Facebook page, and uh, I haven't been on Facebook in years. But we're friends on Facebook, and I just sent you money last week. <laughs> How do you, you send money on, on Facebook? To you. I thought you needed it, and you were like, please send me some money. Venmo me. So I said, oh, crap. Venmo me. I, you're, I'm an influencer now, apparently. Oh, crap. Let me influence you. Okay. I'm already influenced. I'm going to meditate. Okay. Drink, I'm going to drink beet <laughs> – Jam or whatever you have over in this this jar. <laughs> this is a nourishing herbal infusion. Yeah, I'm so nourished. Uh, I, I love that the likes are gone. I think that it's like this. There, there have been extensive studies shown that it's harmful to us. Um, and I think that it's going to be like social media will be like our parents with smoking. You know, when they used to smoke in the car with the kids, and like no one really knew the damage that was doing until ne- like we know and we're like, oh my god, it was gnarly that they would ask us smoking or not, like in a restaurant. You know, I think. That's what our kids are gonna say about social media. I say the same phones. thing about sugar. That same sugar too, man. What a gnarly thing. Oof. That's gonna be Terrible. twenty-five years. We're gonna go. Whoa! What, what were, were we, we doing? Thinking? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. Well, listen. Let me say this. You should. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of Runaway June. Thanks. Big fan of you. You're a great Thank singer. You. Um, Thank you. Everyone should check out Blue Roses. And this thing lasts forever. You probably have four records out. People will be listening to this <laughs> five, six years from now. I hope so. Um, check out Blue Roses, the record. I love We Were Rich. Hey, play some of that uh, Fast As You cover. Because this one. Oh, we played I, this last night. I loved White Yoakum. <laughs> and when I heard this, I was like, oh, boy. Is it my, and it's, so, it's real good. Thank you. Yeah, it's real good. It's real good. Thank you very much. I know you had a long night last night. We've done an hour. Mm-hmm. This is it. We hit one hour here. I so hope we, some of this is usable. It all goes up immediately. <laughs> this is th- it's all usable. There's no editing. There's no here. editing. No filters. No filters. Okay. So um, follow Naomi at Naomi underscore Cook on Instagram. That's right, right? Yeah. You no, know, somebody had in Naomi Cook without the underscore. Who would, who had that? I don't know. You just, did somebody? Why why would you get the underscore? <laughs> Nobody wants an underscore. Like you just someone have, must have had yeah. it. I couldn't believe it. Who runs the Runaway June page? We do. You we on, run you're it, on it clearly. It's a mess. Do guys slide into your personal DMs yes. all the time randomly? I, I actually don't check my DMs anymore. It just would bum me out. It just bummed. It was big time bum out. Because? <laughs> well, I never. I've never done any dating apps ever. Um, like, and so it kind of started to feel like a dating app. Like I was just being hit up by like all kinds of people. It made me kind of feel like, whoa, there's just nothing natural left, and. Um, I was like, I felt like I was being ordered like a pizza. I'm like, no, I just, I just stopped. Don't hate technology. I don't. I, I don't hate it. Don't there's hate been, technology. There's been some good things that have happened, but uh, I, I really don't check my DMs. Like, I'll, I'll talk to my fans in the comment section, 100%. Like, you comment on something, I'll talk to you there. But get out of my DMs. I comment, I comment on every picture, and I never get a message back. <laughs> That's such BS. It is BS. I don't comment. I should comment on stuff. I never do. You don't comment on, it, comment on everything. I know. And I always, I always acknowledge you there. I see Where? You. If you comment on something. Do I? You have I never before. go back and look. at cause Well, then why? What? What is this conversation? Why well, would I like your comment if you're not going to go back and see you that go, I acknowledge You'll comment you. on somebody's and go back and see if they've acknowledged your comment? I mean, you get a little, you get a little oh, alert, I, don't you? Right? Yeah. I, I, have too, alert. I have too many followers. I don't know. My oh, alert. God. I know. <laughs> Like a mild <laughs> flex there. I, I don't, I turn I'm those so off glad that the legs got away. You're a product of this. No, You're I, a product I don't, of I don't, that. I don't even know. All right, here we are. Episode 212, Runaway June. Uh, <laughs> check out Blue Roses. Thank you for coming by. Oh, my God. Thanks for having me. It was so fun. How, it, how did it feel rolling solo doing an interview? 
felt pretty, pretty cool. With you, it felt good. I don't know. I can't say for other ones, though. Yeah. Well, I say just rap. Never do another solo one, ever. <laughs> and also, let me say hi to <laughs> Hannah and Jen. Love them. And yeah. I know they're not here. Uh, but if they want to come in individually, too. You guys can all trash talk each other. Yeah. That'd be great. Oh We've God. cut out all the trash talking. By the way, if you're hearing this, we cut out all the trash talking. We're in therapy. There's yeah, no yeah, trash yeah. talking outside. Yeah. All right. Uh, Naomi, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby.